This audio recording is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Editor's Note The following section is an excerpt from an early draft of Michelle's article, In the Footsteps of a Killer. The day after I placed the order for the cufflinks, I called the kid. I told him I was having the cufflinks shipped overnight to me. To a P.O. box? The kid asked. Well, no, I admitted. A ludicrous scenario flashed through my mind. Eron's, reselling the cufflinks to a store where he happened to work and put in customer addresses. He'd no doubt be suspicious of someone who paid $40 for a next-day delivery of his $8 cufflinks. The best thing to do, I knew, was to turn over the cufflinks to the Eron's investigators. The risk was that they'd be angry I'd taken this kind of unauthorized initiative. Coincidentally, I had recently scheduled my very first interview with Larry Poole in Orange County. I decided that if I felt the interview was going well, I'd explain the story and hand over the tiny gold cufflinks in their square Ziploc bag. The problem was, of all the investigators, the prospect of meeting with Poole was the most intimidating to me. He'd been described as inaccessible and a little remote. I knew he'd been working on the case for the last 14 years. He'd been instrumental along with victim Keith Harrington's attorney brother, Bruce, in the passage of Proposition 69, the DNA Fingerprint, Unsolved Crime, and Innocent Protection Act, which in 2004 established an all-felon DNA database in California. The California Department of Justice now has the largest DNA data bank in the country. Poole and Harrington felt that by expanding the DNA database, they'd surely net Eron's. The disappointment when that didn't happen, it was suggested to me, was sharp. I had imagined Larry Poole as a steely, impassive cop, locked away in a dimly lit room, the walls plastered with Eron's composites. A pleasant, but somewhat formal man, in wire rim glasses and a red checkered shirt, greeted me in the lobby of the Orange County Regional Computer Forensics Laboratory. We sat in a conference room. He was a duty officer for the computer lab that day and when the occasional colleague poked their head in and said something, Poole would respond with a clipped, copy that. I found him a thoughtful, measured speaker, the kind of person whose stoic exterior masks how generous they're being with their insights. When I met with Larry Crompton, it was clear that the retired detective took his failure to solve the case personally. It kept him up at night, Crompton confessed, and he always asked himself, what did I miss? Poole didn't present the same sort of anguish. At first I took this as cockiness. Later I realized it was hope. He was not nearly done yet. We were wrapping up our conversation. I pegged him as someone who prioritizes procedure and decided he wouldn't like the cufflink story. But at the very end, I caved. I don't know why. I began speaking way too fast and wrestling around in my backpack. Poole listened, but his face revealed nothing. I nudged the cufflinks across the conference table at him. He took the bag and examined it very carefully. For me? he asked, stone-faced. Yes, I said. He allowed the slightest hint of a smile. I think I love you, he said. By the time I returned home to Los Angeles, Poole had tracked down the victims and sent them a high-resolution image of the cufflinks by email. The cufflinks had originally belonged to a deceased family member, and the victims had had them in their possession only a short while before they were stolen. They looked like the cufflinks, but the victims were cautious about merely wanting them to be them. They got in touch with another family member who was more familiar with the jewelry. A couple of days later, Poole called me with the news. Not the same cufflinks. I was disappointed. Poole seemed unfazed. I don't get excited like I used to, he told me earlier. A decade ago, when the shock of the DNA match between the EAR and the ONS was still fresh, he had every investigative resource at his disposal. An Orange County Sheriff's Department helicopter once flew to Santa Barbara just to pick up a suspect's DNA swab. The suspect was under active surveillance at the time. Poole traveled to Baltimore to exhume a body. This was before 9-11, and he recalls that parts of the suspect were packed in his carry-on. Eventually, cold case funding dried up, investigators got reassigned, and Poole got less emotionally invested in every new development. 
Even the composite of Eron's that hangs above Poole's desk is deliberate and matter-of-fact. It shows the suspect in a ski mask. Is it of any value? Poole said. No, but we know he looked like that. He showed me the stack of mail he continues to get with tips from the public, including one piece of paper with a photocopy of a man's driver's license photo and the words, This is Eron's. The man is far too young to be a viable suspect. Eight thousand suspects have been examined over the years, Poole estimates. Several hundred have had their DNA run. They conducted a DNA test on one suspect in a southern state twice, when they weren't satisfied with the quality of retrieval the first time. When Poole comes across an especially intriguing suspect, his curt response is always the same. Gotta eliminate him. Despite his reserve, Poole has reason to be optimistic about the case. Everyone who's weathered the ups and downs of the Eron's mystery agrees that the pendulum is currently swinging in an upward direction. I was in a panic. We were hosting, as we had for years, about a dozen adults and four kids under the age of ten, and the second draft of my 7,000-word story was due Tuesday. A few days before, I'd sent out SOS emails, brief and frank pleas for help that I hoped would be understood dinner rolls. Butter. Thanksgiving always made me nostalgic for the Midwest, but the day was sunny and unusually brisk, the kind of California autumn afternoon when, if you concentrate on your friend's gray cardigan and the fork full of pumpkin pie in your mouth and the snippet of NFL commentary running in the background, you can forget the Bougainvillea and the wet swimsuits drying over the backyard chairs. You can imagine that you live somewhere where the seasons actually change. I wasn't myself, though, and patience roiled. I made a bigger deal than I needed to that Pat and bought an undersized turkey. When we went around the table and said what we were thankful for, I forgot the holiday for a moment and shut my eyes, thinking about a wish. After dinner, the kids piled together on the couch and watched The Wizard of Oz. I stayed out of the room. Little kids have big emotions, and mine needed reining in. That Saturday, Patton took Alice for the day and I hunkered down in my office on the second floor to revise and write. About four o'clock in the afternoon, the front doorbell rang. We got a lot of deliveries, and I had, in fact, already answered the door a couple of times that day and signed for packages. I was irritated at yet another interruption. Normally I'd ignore it and let them leave the package at the door. Usually, just to be sure, I'd walk over to our bedroom window and peek out. And yes, there's the back of the FedEx delivery man a front gate closing behind him. I'm not sure what made me get up this time, but I walked a few steps down our curving staircase and called out, Who is it? No one replied. I went to our bedroom window and peeked out. A slim, young African-American kid in a pink shirt and tie was walking away from our house. I had the strong sense he was a teenager. Maybe I saw him in profile for a moment. I guessed he was selling magazine subscriptions door to door and let the drape fall. I went back to work and didn't think more about it. About 45 minutes later, I got up and grabbed my car keys. I made plans to meet Patton and Alice for an early dinner at one of our favorite restaurants in the neighborhood. I made sure the doors were locked and headed out to my car parked on the street. When I was about halfway down our walk, I saw out the corner of my eye the figure of a young man off to my left, walking very slowly with his back to me, in front of my next-door neighbor's house. I'm not sure I would have noted him if his body language hadn't been so unusual. He froze completely when I came bounding out of the house. He was a young African-American kid, not the same kid who'd rung our door, but similarly dressed in a pastel blue shirt and tie. He kept his body still and craned his neck ever so slightly in my direction. I hesitated. I thought again about teenagers selling magazine subscriptions, I wondered if he was gauging me as a possible customer, but I knew it was weirder than that. His body language was so off. I got into my car and drove away, and as I did, I picked up my phone to call the police. I pressed nine and one, but what was I going to say? Suspicious young black kid? That felt racist and like an overreaction. I canceled the call. They weren't doing anything overtly criminal. Still, I hit the brakes and yanked the wheel to the left, making a quick U-turn back to our house. 
It couldn't have been more than forty-five seconds, but neither kid was on the street. Dusk was making it harder to see. I figured they'd rung someone's bell, begun the magazine pitch, and been invited in. I headed to the restaurant. The following night, I was upstairs when I heard the doorbell ring and pat and greet someone at the front door. Michelle, he called. I came down. Our next-door neighbor, Tony, was standing there. Tony was the first neighbor we met when we'd bought our house two and a half years earlier. We hadn't moved in yet, and I was at the house with our contractor, talking about renovations, when an attractive man in his forties peeked in at the front door and introduced himself. My memory is that he was gregarious and a little self-effacing. The previous owner had been a recluse, and Tony had never seen the inside of the house. He was curious. I told him, go ahead, walk around. I thought from his outgoing demeanor that we'd end up being friends, the way you imagine things when you're picturing your life in a new space. He told me he was recently divorced, and his teenage daughter was going to live with him and attend the local all-girls Catholic high school. He was renting the house next door. But our relationship, while always friendly, never blossomed into a real friendship. We waved and made occasional small talk. When we first moved in, Pat and I talked about how we should have a get-together in our backyard and meet all the neighbors. Our intentions were good. We kept talking about it, but then getting waylaid. The house was always being worked on, or one of us was traveling. But when Alice's ball flew over the fence into their yard, Tony and his daughter always graciously returned it. When I found a motherless baby pigeon on the curb in front of their house and fashioned a nest from a wicker basket and leaves and fastened it to a tree branch, Tony came out and smiled at me. You're a good person, he said. I liked him, but our interactions were relegated to comings and goings, to moments between dog walking and toddler wrangling. My second floor office faces their house. A distance of only about fifteen feet separates us. I've become accustomed to the rhythm of their lives. In the late afternoons, I hear their front door slam, and Tony's daughter, who has a beautiful voice, begins to sing. I always mean to tell her what a beautiful voice she has. I always forget. Tony was at our front door because he wanted to tell us that they'd been robbed yesterday. I think I know what happened, I said, and motioned for him to sit down on our living room couch. I explained the doorbell and no answer and what I saw. He nodded. The elderly couple that lived on the other side of Tony had seen the same kids hauling bags out of Tony's house. They got in through the kitchen window and completely ransacked the place. The cops told him that it's a common ruse used by teams of petty thieves on holiday weekends. Ring and see if anyone's home. If no one answers, break in. It's just iPads and computers, Tony said. But I keep thinking, what if my daughter had been home alone? What might have happened then? At the word daughter, his voice quavered. His eyes welled. So did mine. You don't have to explain, I said. It's such a violation. I reached out and put my hand on his. Michelle's a crime writer, Patton said. Tony looked surprised. I don't even know what you do, he said. From now on, the three of us told each other, we'll look out for each other. We'd alert each other when we were going out of town. We'd be better neighbors. We promised. Later that night, I kept going over the events of the last few days in my head. I thought about the intimacy of the moment in the living room, the unexpected surge of emotion we shared with Tony. We don't even know his last name, I said to Patton. I have a nightly ritual with Alice, who is a troubled sleeper and has terrifying dreams. Every night before falling asleep, she call out for me to come into her bedroom. I don't want to have a dream she says. I brush her sandy hair back, put my hand on her forehead, and look straight into her big brown eyes. You are not going to have a dream, I tell her, with a crisp, confident enunciation. Her body releases its tension, and she goes to sleep. I leave the room, hoping that what I promised, but have no control over, will be true. That's what we do, all of us. We make well-intentioned promises of protection we can't always keep. I'll look out for you. But then you hear a scream, 
and you decide it's some teenagers playing around. A young man jumping a fence is taking a shortcut. The gunshot at 3 a.m. is a firecracker or a car backfiring. You sit up in bed for a startled moment. Awaiting you is the cold, hard floor and a conversation that may lead nowhere. You collapse onto your warm pillow and turn back to sleep. Sirens wake you later. I saw Tony walking his big white dog this afternoon and waved at him from outside my car, in between fumbling for my keys and remembering something I had to do. I still don't know his last name.